Jewish home life. Uh, I've been with the organization for 13 years. Um, I was here when Vermont Commons opened its doors nine years ago. Um, please forgive that. That is a security test that's happening with our call spot system that, for whatever reason, they decided Sunday was going to be the day that they did it. And so every few minutes that chirp is going to go off, but please disregard it. Um, anyway, we are so excited to have such a wonderful crowd here. For, uh, to hear Gavin Brown, who has been on our board, and he is uh, just an incredible neurologist that uh, we are so happy to have. But if you will indulge me for two minutes to tell you a little bit about Jewish Home Life, we have been around since 1951, uh, started as the William Bremen Jewish Home on Town Mill Road in Buckhead, and have grown over the past 15 to 20 years to encompass every stage of aging. So we do everything from independent living on our Buckhead campus uh, with the Zayman Tower and the Jewish Tower. Uh, and that is for low-income seniors. And then we have Berman Commons here for our assisted living and memory care. We also do rehab at the Williams Jewish Home and the Rehabilitation Center, so that's short-term rehab, Medicare uh, rehab, and then skilled nursing. And then people don't always know that we have at-home care services. We have Epstein Home Care, which is the Jewish community's home care agency. It is the only home care agency that is supported through Jewish Federation of Greater Atlanta as part of Jewish Home Life. And then we also have Weinstein Hospice, the only Jewish hospice in Georgia. Both of those are open to everyone. Our entire organization is open to all. You do not have to be Jewish to be part of our organization. But when you are part of our organization, we take care of you. Our wraparound services make sure that you can age in place no matter where you are in our system. So if you're here at Berman Commons and you need palliative care services, we push in Weinstein Hospice seamlessly. If you need rehab, you go straight to our V rehab and then you come right back. Um, and then if such time occurs that you need uh, skilled nursing, um, if you are part of our system, you get priority access into the William Freeman Jewish Home. So just wanted to put that out there. Berman Commons is um, nine years old now, like I said. Um, if you have never been here before, I highly encourage you to take a tour because it is a neighborhood gem. Um, it is named for Candy and Steve Berman and their family, and they are actually here today. So. I'm excited to do this. I, there's a bright light right there. I don't know if you can look here. 
Um, this is, you know, the, the treating cognitive impairment and dementia is something we do, uh, obviously it's, it's part of our bread and butter in neurology, it's something we do increasingly often as people grow older. Um, and dementia prevention, uh, there, there's sort of a growing body of literature uh, about how to prevent dementia, and, 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 and that's becoming an interest not only of mine, but um, a lot of my colleagues. And so uh, that's, that's part of what I'm going to focus on today. I want to give a shout out to Candy and Steve, too. They were instrumental in me doing this first the first time I did it, and, and uh, which was about eight years ago, so it's exciting to do it again. Thank you for coming. Um, and thank you to all of you guys. I guess I can't switch. I got to switch. And also, I'm sort of ADD, and, uh, and I'll go off the cuff a lot, and, and I'm very informal, so if I say, if you have a question, or if I say something that, that you know, interests you, raise your hand, yell out, um, um, unfortunately, I have nothing to disclose, I'm not getting paid to do this, uh, I, I, I would say, actually, I guess I did, uh, um, a couple things. Number one, I'll talk a lot about nutrition. I'm not licensed or certified or anything as a nutritionist, but um, it's a it's a pretty strong personal interest of mine, and so I you know it's it's something that uh, I would say that I'm uh, well familiar with the literature about. But I would just give that disclaimer. Um, and so you know, I, I I gave this talk like I said eight years ago. Um, most of the important points on dementia prevention and on cognitive preservation as we grow older have not changed. And I like this cartoon. It's, you know, this is a doctor from the future that says, uh, uh, I've got revolutionary advice, diet, exercise, yeah, drink water, eat your veggies. Um, that's the way, those are, you know, um, the basic, most important points uh, of of cognitive preservation and of prevent, uh, preventing dementia are lifestyle related. Um, so uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. And, and today, I guess, you know, when I say, when I use the word dementia, um, I'm going to be, uh, re I'm referring to Alzheimer's disease specifically, um, that which uh, comprises the vast majority of cases of dementia. It's something like 80%, maybe more, depending on the literature that you believe, uh, it, it, of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. Uh, actually, it's Alzheimer disease. Uh, did you guys know that? When you say it, talking to the microphone? Is that better? Yes. Alzheimer disease. So, here's a tidbit. When you, that when you, when you refer to an eponymous disease, a disease that's named after somebody, there's not an apostrophe S after uh, so it's Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson disease. Um, I just call it Alzheimer's because that's what people say. But anyway, my mom's an English teacher, so she's going to be watching the report. Uh, and these are my, I don't, you know, they say make uh, three points and reinforce them throughout your talk. I have three words. This is my main point. Dementia is preventable. Um, you know why this is not a public service announcement that's all over billboards and commercials? I, I, I couldn't tell you. Doctors don't do a good job, actually, uh, of talking about this, I think, to patients. Um, patients both early on in their life and as, as they grow older, because at every stage, dementia is uh, preventable and cognition, your cognitive function is preservable. So I say cognitive preservation, it means Kind of keeping what you got, staying, staying, uh, get, maintaining, you know, normal memory, normal processing functions as you grow older. Um, you know, even uh, among patients who have cognitive impairment, uh, they they can slow it down. Um, and in fact, I I would introduce to you and something I talk to my patients about is the concept of uh, of sort of momentum, momentum behind. Uh, the changes that you can make in your life, you can, you can sort of, you can slow the speed at which your um, biological aging is occurring. So this is, these are demographics for the United States. They look similar across the world, a little bit different country by country and, and region by region. 
but uh, as a population, we are growing older, and um, we're not we're not spawning as quickly. <laughs> um, so, in sometime around 2020, 2021, in the United States, the number of 65 year olds surpassed the number of five year olds, and you can see the rate at which that curve is moving um, is pretty steep. Uh, that that's obviously that's a that's a uh, projected uh, rate. That's no, we we were we're not yet in 2030. Um, but it's but we we're living longer. That's part of it. We're having fewer babies. Um, there and and there's this slide. You could make kind of a whole talk about this slide alone. Actually, the World Health Organization has projected based on this that by 2030, dementia will be a public health crisis by the definitions that they use um, if we don't do something about it. And that's, that, that's right around the corner. Uh, and we're living a lot longer. And that's mostly thanks. This also is uh, US, uh, the United States life expectancy data, um, we're living longer mostly thanks to improvements in cardiovascular health, um, preventing heart attacks, and living longer afterwards. Um, I, that's attributable to the majority of the steep climb of this curve. Um, we, this also, there um, are, this curve looks different. There are racial and ethnic disparities, and so this, this combines them all together. That also is probably a topic that you could talk a lot about, but, but um, the bottom line is, you know, since 1955, when in the United States, the average life expectancy was 60 years old, to now, uh, we are, and this is actually, this stopped at 2021, there was a dip after 2020, which is partly attributable, I, I think actually, you uh, mostly attributable to deaths, young deaths from COVID, which pulled this data uh, downwards a little bit. Uh, we'll get the, uh, the, the age down a little bit. We actually, the, the curve has now gone back up um, in the life, average life expectancy now in the United States among everybody is about 78 years old. And again, <laughs> racial and ethnic disparities. Um, uh, uh, that we could kind of uh, dive a little deeper into. Um, but today's elderly are healthier than they were before. And you guys all know, you know, we say the 80s, the new 70, or you'll look good for 80, you look good for 85. So, but, but, and, and I guess I would tell you in practice, more and more I see what we probably used to call elderly. I don't know what the definition of that term is, and I'm not going to use it. I don't want to offend anybody or discriminate against others. Um, but uh, but you know, more and more we see patients living well into their 80s and doing well cognitively and physically. Um, and and the expectation has changed. It frustrates me actually when I hear that a doctor said, "Well, that's." You're get, the reason for that sentence, you're getting old. I mean, because if you stop there, then you don't do anything about it. It's a, it's a self fulfilling prophecy. So I never accept that that's just because you're getting old. Um, it, a lot of you have probably heard this is the square life curve. This is what we all want. We want to be born and then have perfect health until the day that we die in our sleep. Um, <laughs> years old. Uh, you know, and, and, and it, interestingly, this concept has now, it's the, the y-axis is health status. You guys have probably, some of you have heard this uh, concept of health span, which has now been popularized by a guy named Peter Atia, uh, who I actually have not read his book, but I've read a little bit about him, and I know I'm, I'm sort of vaguely familiar. I mean, he talks about the concept of lifespan versus health span. Which is very important, health span just make meaning and you know how physically and cognitively well you are. And health span being more important than lifespan, you know, and, and but having them as part of a uh, curve that, that, that takes 90 degree angles like this is, uh, is, is I think, the goal. Um, maintaining your health span throughout life. The reality is that as we age, you know, I mean, based on what we, based on some data that we have, um, 
And what I see, and you know, really probably any doctor, even not a neurologist, would tell you, is that there are functions that um, that decline a little bit with age. And this actually, the, the, these data points uh, are from a large study that was done on uh, instrumental activities of daily living, which is you know, getting out of bed on your own, taking a bath, making a meal, doing your bits and cognitive stuff, like doing your bills, driving, and those that, that those tasks do, if you you know, if you, as we grow older, decline a little bit with age. And to go back to the concept of momentum, I mean, I think that if you, if, if, if there are certain things, certain preventative measures, especially lifestyle style measures, that you can take at any point of this curve to draw it out a little bit, to make the curve a little bit flatter. I mean, that's sort of the, you know, I, I would apply the concept of the momentum of biological aging to this. Uh, <clears throat> but what do we really know about normal aging? That's Scotty, was that his name? Right, cool. Bones. Start Scotty? Bones. No, it's Bones. Bones is the doctor, okay. That's Bones, the doctor. <laughs> With this wand that uh, you know, it's the, and in fact, you know, I, I there, there's this thing I call the the myth of hyper-competent medicine, in which I have patients who expect us to be able to um, to diagnose better than we can, especially when it comes to cognitive syndromes and cognitive symptoms. Um, and, you know, it's a science that's that's rapidly advancing, and I have a lot of hope and optimism, but. Um, but I don't have one of those one of those ones yet. Uh, and the truth is, the the study, the scientific study, the longevity is is in its infancy. Um, you know, it's longevity scientists are actually a group that's growing. Longevity science is a discipline uh, that's growing. There's now like a chair of longevity science at Harvard. There, but they're but uh, but they actually they're they're well respected uh, longevity science researchers um, now. But longevity takes a long time. Time takes time to study. I mean, there have not been studies yet that took uh, people when they were born, subjects when they were born, and have followed them for a hundred years. Um, in fact, a lot of the data that we have on longevity, what's good for you, what's good to prevent dementia, and other things, is retrospective. It's where uh, you know, uh, researchers take a population of people um, and, and, and look back at them and survey them, and, then, and, and now with AI, they can uh, read through health databases quickly and make associations, extrapolate things, but basically, um, you know, this is still a science that's in its infancy. I'll tell you, longevity scientists unanimously believe and would tell you that the first 150-year-old has been born. Um, it's an interesting, you know, that's something they throw out as a wow factor, but that's what any of them would tell you. Um, don't know if he or she is five or 50 or 70, but that's, uh, that's, that's something I would throw out there. Um, and, and interventions, and it's hard to study that. It is hard. It's to take, you know, the gold standard of proving something in Western medicine is a randomized controlled trial where you take two groups and that are as similar as you can get them. You control for everything that's different as best as you can, and then you intervene on one group and then don't intervene on the other group, your control group. That's the goal, and then follow them 10 years, 20 years. That's hard to do for this. Um, again, it's a, it, a study like that takes a long time to do. There are some that are underway. Uh, a few of them actually are at Emory. Um, the, those studies, when it comes to dementia prevention, actually at Emory and other places, um, they, are, they are taking a large group and, and, and mining as many details out of their history as they can and then following them. Well, rather than intervening, actually, the biggest study like this, they're just following them and asking them a lot of questions at regular intervals. But, um, but anyway, uh, more to come on that. Um, 
you've probably heard the concept of super aging. So there, there, this woman, Lisa Feldman Barrett, actually is a, is a neuroscientist who studies super agers. Um, super aging, the definition that she uses, and I'm, I'm actually not sure if, if, if this is widely agreed on, um, but it is people who are older than the age of 75 who, when you test them on uh, cognitive and physical metrics, I want to get, what's that? The mic's not working. Oh, the mic's not working? Yeah, the front speakers are working, the back speakers are not. It's working fine. It's working? Yeah. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. And we can't change, we can't slow down time, obviously, but there are certain things we can do to slow biological aging. I'm opening my phone to make sure I don't miss any of my points. Any questions yet? Um, so <clears throat> cognitive aging is a term that's used to describe the expected changes of cognitive function. You know, cognition, you guys know, that's just a broad term that includes memory. Oh, I got a red mic. Oh. Hello. Oh, much better. Thank you. Sorry. That one, it looked like it might say bad. It was turned off. Um, <laughs> broadly used to describe the, the cognitive changes that happen with age. Cognition is meaning your memory, your ability to process, your ability to understand new things and multitask. That's cognition broadly. And cognitive aging is what's normally expected with age. So when you say normal cognitive aging by the 90-year-old in clinic, it's a little bit forgetful, um, you know, a, a, a little bit slower to learn a new concept. That can be normal cognitive aging for an 80 year old. That can be normal cognitive aging. What we actually know now, and this applies to what I'm going to get into shortly, is that the that even as we age, at the age of 65, 75, and 80, your brain uh, remains uh, re re retains plasticity, which is the ability to change. And we've always known that about kids. Uh, kids, young people can have brain injuries and make like a remarkable recovery them sometimes. We call that plasticity, the brain's ability to bounce back. You, and there has been a thought actually until about the past 10 or 15 years that you just lose that, that at some point the circuits are um, as good as they're going to get and that when you lose them they're gone and they're unrepairable. That simply is not true. So we, you know, a, a relatively new concept is that your brain retains plasticity um, even once, in, in, even among patients who have developed either an early stage of dementia or who are who have aged cognitively a little bit more than we expect, uh, there's hope that they change. Um, their brain, their brain retains this plasticity. Um, so, and, but with cognitive aging, I mean, some of the things that don't frighten us when we hear them uh, or don't raise a red flag. Uh, it, when we hear them in, my, in a neurology clinic, is patients who have a little bit of difficulty into their 70s and 80s with, number one, episodic memory, which is just your, re that's your short-term memory, like your recall. What happened um, a couple weeks ago? Uh, what did you have for dinner last Saturday? A conversation here and there. Um, you can acceptably lose a little bit of that, and that's okay. Executive function, it's, you guys heard of executive function, it's kind of a broad term um, that's basically your ability to, it's, it's higher level thing, your ability to um, make judgments on things, process multiple items, uh, multiple data at once, um, to multitask, although I'm really not, 
I'm not sure anybody can truly multitask. I think there's an automatic thing that you do well. You can do that while you're doing something else not quite as well as you would if you're focusing on it. But, but, but executive function includes that. But those things do uh, decline a little bit with age. <laughs> um, and, there, and, and so does fluent intelligence. Fluent intelligence encompasses a lot of those, a lot, a lot of what we would call executive functions. So you like your ability to kind of process a totally new concept. Um, your ability, I would say, I mean, half jokingly say the ability to like, you know, kind of use an iPhone to look at iPhone. That, uh, um, you know, but, or, 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 or to use some type of new computer program um, or something like that. Basic vocabulary, crystallized intelligence uh, does, should not uh, generally decline with age. Um, you know, and, and what we know about
um, are being studied as a, as, as a potential target for treatment in Alzheimer's disease. As you guys may know, every gene makes a protein. That's its goal, that's its, that's, that's its function. And so the proteins that some of these protective genes make are being studied um, as to sort of why they protect, if, if, if they truly protect and why. Um, and uh, the one that we, the, the, the gene that we know the most about, that actually is by far the most common, uh, commonly identified risk gene for Alzheimer's disease, is the APOE gene. Um, and you guys may have heard about this, and there's, uh, there are, you, you can actually do a genotype for it. APOE4 is the gene that confers risk. Um, you know, you, you get one allele from your mom, one from your dad, so the gene is both of those alleles. If you have one APOE4 allele, uh, which is like a quarter of the population, a little bit more, has at least one APOE4 allele, um, it increases your risk by about 1.5 fold. It increases your risk by, by, by a, a little bit. If you have two APOE4 genes, um, the risk is much higher. That's concerning two APOE4 genes. It increases risk like 15 to 20 fold, kind of just depending. That's a very, very low single digit number of the population that has two APOE4 genes. It's something that they do, I think even this 23andMe and these common, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the gene testing that you can get, the screening that you can get that do APOE4 allele testing. Um, for people that are interested. So epigenetics, though, what I'm more interested in, is the way that you can impact the, uh, the expression of the genes you have. And again, this goes back to lifestyle changes uh, that you can make, um, uh, you know, uh, physical activity, nutrition, etc. that, that very clearly uh, impact the expression of your genes. Um, and epigenetics has been studied in this APOE, in APOE4 carriers. Um, there are a couple of trials now that, that very, very clearly show that APOE4 carriers who take care of themselves um, normalize their risk. It looks like they actually can impact that genetic risk um, and there have been studies, actually, that looked at specific interventions uh, that, that seem to help, um, one of which is increasing uh, the omega, it, it is supplementing with omega-3 or eating omega-3 rich fish, more importantly. Um, appears to actually shift that, uh, to, to normalize or at least lower the risk uh, of developing dementia among APOE4 carriers. Yeah. Yes? Isn't it when you say physical activity, I would hope Yes, absolutely. I'm going to get there because that's one of my favorite things to talk about. But yes, that that number, you know, it. Um, I set expectations kind of depending on where I find patients. I'm a cheerleader for uh, for physical activity. I love it. It's great for mental health, and it categorically reduces your risk of dementia. It's a settled science. It's not a question. Um, people who remain active, physically active. Um, it, 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 it unquestionably lowers your risk, it pushes back against this. Um, it, and, and, and importantly, probably as the cardiovascular and weight training, it looks like a combo of cardiovascular and weight training is probably the right thing to do. Um, we, we get, uh, we, we, some of what we recommend comes from uh, uh, cardiac data or data that, that, that comes from cardiovascular research studies just based on like specifically what we recommend, but but uh, 100, 180 minutes you said. 150, 200 you know, I tell patients work at do something physical most days of the week. So you know four days if you can. More is better. Something that makes you sweat is good. Walking's good. If you don't walk though, you got to walk like three miles. You got to walk at a brisk pace. You got to sweat. Walking is much better than sitting. Sitting is like smoking, um, in, in my mind. Uh, but yeah, but you know something that makes you sweat. So something that gets your heart rate up, something that makes you sweat. Absolutely. Um, 
And on that note, what can you, this is why you guys came here. What time is it? How much? I'm like, okay, oh my god, so I'm going to go fast, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm going to be here as long as you'll let me. So, well, how can you prevent dementia? Let's get right into it. An ounce of lifestyle, proverbial ounce of lifestyle. To prevent dementia, you got to move there. <laughs> That's the end. Drop the mic. This is Osceola, Italy. This is a one of these coastal Italian towns that's called a blue zone. You guys heard of the blue zones? It's called a blue zone. It's one of these uh, geographic regions where there's astronomical people live a lot longer. There's astronomically low risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Osceola, the NIH descended on them one, then they kicked them out because look, I mean, what you want? I mean, you live there, but. Um, but you, the uh, uh, 10 to 15 percent of the population uh, lives to be lives longer than 90 years old, and the incidence of Alzheimer's disease among them is in the low single digits. So it's way, way better than, than they do. It, 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 it's drastically different here and in other blue zones um, than it is in in the United States. Uh, uh, and, and other really industrialized nations. You can see why, so I like this slide because what is it? What do you notice? It was beautiful, number one, beautiful. <laughs> I would not be stressed if I lived there. Um, there aren't factories billowing crap into the air. Um, they probably eat a lot of fish. They're probably physically, I see wine road. They're probably physically active. I don't know what's on the other side of the hill, but I think it probably looks pretty similar to this. Um, so, and, and a lot of the blue zones are, uh, are similar. I mean, some of the other blue zone uh, regions are, there's, there's regions in Japan, like Okinawa is a blue zone. Um, interestingly, uh, Loma Linda, California is a blue zone, and they think, we think that that's because there's a very large population of Seventh-day Adventists there um, and they are very nutrition focused and you know I think they walk on Shabbat. Is it on Shabbat? Yeah. They walk on but on uh, um, Saturday Sunday. I mean I think they they they're physically active. It's it's a more health conscious culture among the religion of Seventh Day Adventists. And so that's one of the so that you think that's why Loma Linda is in the group. Um, there are several cities on coastal in, in, in Italy, coastal Italy, and coastal Greece um, that are on the list. Um, and you know, they're they're fish eating, low stress, physically active uh, populations. They also don't eat as much. If you look at a Mediterranean plate, it's smaller, it's more colorful, and I'll get to that in just a second because I didn't know this. Uh, oh, that's. Also, I <laughs> So nutrition is, um, uh, I, I, I love talking about this, I preach about it, I think my name would stick with it a little bit sometimes, but uh, the, the, the basic nutritional advice, again, I'm not a nutritionist, I just uh, rattle off a lot of the data that's been done in <laughs> cognitive and the neuroscience data that's got nutrition behind it. Um, the, the best advice I can give you, and it, it's easy to remember, comes from Michael Pollan, who's like one of the godfathers of modern nutrition. He says, eat real food, not too much, mostly plants. Practical advice. You know, real food, whole food, vegetables, the, the non-packaged foods, it's got more than three or four ingredients, it probably does not count as real food. Um, not too much Amer in America, we, our, our diet in America is abysmal, I'm sure. Some of you have heard the SAD diet, the standard American diet. We eat too much, we are overfed and undernourished. Um, so, eat, so not too much portion size is important, and mostly plants. People that eat this way live longer, and, ha and, 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 and it, 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 it uh, cle very clearly reduces your risk of developing dementia. Now, um, I'll tell you, mostly plants, it is I, I, I like that a plant-based diet uh, is is the, the plant-based diet right now is the most studied diet actually even more so than the Mediterranean diet uh, for health outcomes 
Um, I, I wouldn't tell you that definitely that it's the best, nor would I um, uh, you know, you know, uh, shame anyone or actually steer you away from fish. In fact, I think you should eat fish. That's what I tell patients. Mostly plants, there should be meat in there. The more red meat, the worse. Um, and processed meat and food uh, it, it is horrible for you. You know, there are, there are several uh, models that have been studied specifically in dementia prevention. Um, and again, you know, the one, the one that I, the advice that I give patients uh, is a mostly plant-based, is a pescatarian diet. Mostly plants, fish a few days a week, as little red meat as possible. Um, the, the, the MIND diet, and MIND diet is sort of a model of the Mediterranean diet. MIND diet actually is the one of these that's been specifically studied uh, or that, would, that was to be designed to be studied uh, in, in cognitive prevention. It looks about as good as the Mediterranean diet. It's got a few more uh, nuts and berries in it. Mediterranean. Both of them have a lot of vegetables. You can look up the models. They're easy to find. So there's lots of recipes online. You, uh, Google the Mediterranean diet. The American Heart Association comes up. It's got tons of recipes. And the low, who's heard of Grain Brain by Perlmutter? This guy Perlmutter. You may have heard it. It's a book, yeah, it's a book that uh, came out it's a, a while ago, 10 maybe more years ago. So the low glycine, that there is evidence that um, patients with poorly controlled di diabetes have a higher incidence of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and because of that, actually a while ago, there were several studies that looked into so, uh, insulin sensitivity, glucose dysregulation, what the things that cause uh, diabetes, and a similar processes appear to happen in the brains as happen in sort of the pancreas and the body of patients who eat a um, high glycemic diet. So the, Perlmutter wrote this book, Brain Brain. He reviews the data. I'm actually, I agree with a lot of what he says, not all. He, he actually thinks that people should go gluten-free. Say it again? Yeah. Oh, and he thinks people should go gluten-free. That's difficult, and it's not something that I push patients to do. I mean, unless they really want to. He gets, a, he gets into like leaky gut, which I think there's something to. The bottom line is look, a low glycemic diet does look like it helps in Alzheimer's prevention. And if there is something to this, um, you know, what to do about that is a little bit less dessert. I mean, you know, a little bit more protein. The sugars that are good for you are included in these mind in the mind in the Mediterranean diet. And so, you know, I mean the sugars that are good for you meaning um, the, the, the starches that are good for you, the sugars that come from veggies rather than chocolate cake. Oh, love, by the way, it's up for the day. So anyway, um, try to be non-judgmental about nutrition, right? Because people aren't going to, you know, you want to find, you want to take all the flavor out of life. Um, but, and, and, and this is an so uh, the, his, that the research that led to that book and the movement that it sort of created led to this kind of catchy term that Alzheimer's disease is type three diabetes. Um, if you have diabetes and it's controlled, don't worry about this. And the point actually of, of this research um, is that the biochemical changes in the brain appear to be the same uh, as biochemical changes in, in Alzheimer's, appear to be the same as the biochemical changes in the body uh, with diabetes. It doesn't process insulin and sugar quite as well. That leads to downstream damage and inflammation and stuff like that. If you have diabetes and it's controlled, don't worry. I mean, you hear this, it's like, oh shit, but don't worry. Um, so there's a, a, you know, I took out some of the slides about specific nutrition advice. I just decided to make a lot of slides. But, uh, but the, the bottom line is green leafy vegetables appear to be the best. Um, a, a, I mean, this, these are just a couple of points, there's a couple of data points. Um, they, consumption of more than two servings of vegetables, a week slow cognitive, slow cognitive decline among normal elderly, 30 or 30, 35%. Um, and a couple servings of vegetables uh, 
this is a this is daily. Health services vegetables daily is equivalent to adding five years of cognitive aging in one study. And um, veg, you know, vegetable juice looks good. Look, it's not it's not as good. Looks good if your stomach can tolerate it. Um, so, and, and, and dietary sources of omega-3, polyunsaturated fatty acids, which is like oily fish and certain seeds, um, are uh, very clearly have a protective effect against dementia. I think I told you there was a study that was actually done where they looked at APOE4 carriers, people who had one allele that was a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, eating fish, um, was uh, significantly reduced their risk of developing Alzheimer's disease over a 10 year period. Supplementing omega 3 was a close second, and eating a normal diet, they had a normal risk. They did not you know, change their risk. So, uh, oily fish is good. Three times a week is what I tell people to ask me. I like salmon. I have the light sardines, but the ones that they're kind of nasty, some people. But, uh, but uh, you know, it, it counts. Um, and, uh, and, and again, this is just a data point from one study, but it appeared to uh, eating, eating the oil and fish only uh, more than once a week appeared to lower the risk by 30 to 40%. And these omega 6s, so the stuff that's in the omega 6 uh, oils are, are bad for you. The ratio of omega 6 to omega 3 is important, and we can get into that like, after this if you want to. But, but things that are high in omega-6 are the sesame oils, corn oils, sap, uh, sapphire grapeseed. Sunflower was in a lot of stuff. So sunflower is going on. Look at the ingredients. It's not, I don't know. And, and was that? I think this turned off, too. Can you hear me? I just have to hold it closer. Um, so more interesting. So are you guys all still with me? Are you having fun? All right, good. Um, so the, there, this is a fascinating step, that one study among several that show that the uh, gut microbiome, which means um, that if you take a little bit of liquid out of your stomach and your, and your intestine, culture it on a plate, what bacteria grow out of it? So we've all got helpful that we all have bacteria that live in symbiosis with us. They're friends, they're cold friendly bacteria, many of them are, some of them are not, uh, and, uh, or some of them can overgrow, in which case they're not, but um, the gut microbiome, there's a clear association between certain gut microbiomes and the development of Alzheimer's disease. Now, this is fascinating, you could go a few different directions with it. Um, it, it the, what, the, the, what has the biggest impact on your gut microbiome is what you eat. You know, so certain foods are probiotic, certain foods are prebiotic, good food, the stuff I've been talking about, green leafy vegetables, um, uh, are, are um, set the stage for what grows in your belly. But there, there's a very, and it, interestingly too, and some of you may know this, there's strong evidence that people that maintain good dental hygiene, people who brush their teeth regularly and see the dentist regularly, have a lower incidence of Alzheimer's disease. That's probably why. Um, it, 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 it's, it changes your gut microbiome significantly. Um, there's actually, there's also a movement, so that's that's a fact. How am I doing, sorry? Yeah, we need to address the questions though. So. Okay, I'm, I got a lot of slides. <laughs> something to keep in mind. Now, <laughs> this is fascinating. Have you, did you guys hear recently that this came out, wasabi might prevent dementia? Yes, you and So does uh, Crohn's or colitis have anything to do with the, that last slide that you said with the gut? There, so there is evidence that patients with poorly controlled, with active inflammatory bowel disease mm -hmm. might have a 
a slightly higher incidence of Alzheimer's. He's actually found that happens to a doctor who has it with an early stage of Alzheimer's who like got the literature and brought it to me. But there's a little bit of evidence that poorly, that especially when it's active, that inflammatory bowel disease um, it impacts dementia risk and, can be a, and, and, and increases your risk of Alzheimer's uh, disease. Now, I, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, even inactive disease, if it's chronic, can, do, can scar your gut, it can affect absorption. What to do about that? I'm, you know, it's just treated as best as, as, as you can. It's not something. I, it's not a point of fear that I would put into. You know, just I would still. Um, I, I would just echo all the points that I've been making. Um, but but that, that's the answer to that question. Um, wasabi might prevent dementia, guys. Who likes to eat wasabi with a spoon? <laughs> I actually love it too. It clears your sinuses. Um, but they're, 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 so we, that came from, there, there, J Japan is another population that's been studied a lot because they have a very, you know, Okinawa is a blue zone, but the entire country of Japan has a much lower risk of Alzheimer's disease than we do in the United States. And what we know, even more interestingly, is patients who were, is Japanese people, people who were born in Japan and live their early adult, live their early life there, who move to the United States, adopt our risk of Alzheimer's disease. Now, exactly why that is, you know, is a point of debate. That I would personally say probably a lot of it's related to diet, maybe some of it's related to stress too. Um, and to the, you know physical activity, but diet, I mean, would be my number one there. Um, and uh, so it's just another interesting point. Um, ultra processed foods, this is one of the most important things I can tell you. Ultra, these ultra processed foods are terrible for you. Um, there have been now three large studies just in the past five years and recently that show that things like you know processed foods, like candies, packaged foods, anything with a lot of ingredients, it very clearly increase your risk of developing dementia. I mean, you know, for people that I, I don't, again, it's not, I don't know, I, I hate putting kind of fear into people, but just to, 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 to sort of speak to the facts, um, you know, they're, 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 this, is, this is a settled science. Um, Ultra-processed foods are terrible for you, terrible for your brain. I mean, I personally think they're probably attributable to increased risk of uh, colorectal cancer among young people that I think most GI doctors agree, terrible for you. So it's got a lot, ultra-processed food, the broad, you know, group of food, but, it is, but any fast food's ultra-processed, sodas are ultra-processed, anything that's out of a, a package, anything that's got more than three or four ingredients, it is ultra-processed. Um, yeah, <laughs> So physical active, physical activity, exercise, I love it. Um, it is at least as important as nutrition uh, in dementia prevention. Um, it's good for you, it's good for your physical health, it's good for your cognitive health. Um, it, 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 if you look at the at data, and studies have been done, um, uh, staying physically active is actually probably more, they're both important, but it's probably more important than staying and socializing and, stay, and doing cognitive games. You should do both. Socialization is important, but physical activity has a uh, a, a, a huge impact on your um, on, on your dement risk of developing dementia, both Alzheimer's disease, but all cause dementia. Vascular cognitive impairment being the second most common cause of dementia. Um, it's the fountain of youth. Uh, I think that's the uh, that's the NIH's little website on, on, on with suggestions of what to do. But basically, you know, I mean, as I said, what I tell patients is that you should do something that makes you so you should move and exercise more days than not, which means at least four, five is ideal. The, the more the better. A rest is probably important if you're doing, especially if you're doing lifting and stuff like that. But something that makes you sweat for at least thirty minutes, at least four days a week. Um, there is, really, there is, there, there, there was a very interesting study, two studies, I don't want to slide, I'll tell you about the, what uh, physical activity actually, in, in one big study that was done, done clearly uh, increased the volume of the hippocampus, which is one of the, the uh, memory centers of the brain, the important memory center of the brain. 
Um, it increased the volume of the hippocampus among people who exercise compared to the control group. I mean, it literally, uh, you know, beefed up and built their brain like a muscle. Um, uh, so, uh, they, similar studies have actually been done on people who have, um, who are cognitively active at work into uh, older age, 75, 80, and beyond, and who keep working, um, appear to actually maintain hippocampal volume better. Now I'm conflicted about that. I, I was telling somebody before the talk, you know, I have patients who are at the age where they're either ready to retire or maybe want to, and I think you should, I think you should, if you do move to that place I showed you earlier, move to uh, Austria, or if you move to Italy or travel there, but you know, I, I, I'm sometimes conflicted about exactly what to tell them because there is, you, you, I mean, my advice is stay mentally active if you do. Stay mentally active, and that, uh, that, that it's very, very important. They say that baby boomers are going back. They are retiring when they're supposed to, but actually are returning to work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, you know, yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I mean, there's, there are probably several reasons why. I mean, you know, they, they maintaining, being cognitively active, the most important among them, there's probably several reasons why. Um, but just staying, you know, it, it, it goes to the point of just staying cognitively active. It's very, very important. It literally uh, increases the volume of your brain. Where am I? Social, that socialization is very, very important too. Again, every study that's been done that looked at this showed benefit, um, not only among patients who have developed an early stage of dementia, it progresses slower among people who socialize, uh, but the, but, oh, uh, is that five minute warning? <laughs> okay, how many more jerks do I have? <laughs> um, but very clearly important uh, in, in um, so, what's about everybody asks me what supplements they should take? Um, don't take Prevagen. Prevagen um, is the, uh, the uh, jellyfish one that they have in the house. Don't take it. Don't take it. So people ask me about supplements a lot. The bottom line is that they are not. It's it's far more important to get dietary nutritional sources of these things. Supplements really don't count nearly as much. Um, there is not yet a supplement that has been you know clearly proven to um, to uh, take the place of good nutrition. <laughs> good nutrition. Um, it, it's, so labdoor.com, when people have teams that like take some, what, you know, I, I, I get, give them labdoor.com. I think this used to be a great website. I'll tell you, look at it and see what you think. I, I got on there yesterday just to, in, in, in preparation of this talk, and it's not, they don't have as many of the vitamins listed that they used to. It's a, it rates vitamins. I might need to get you another one. It used to be a great one. And you're, it's not something that might have changed about this. This is an old slide. But anyway, it's Take a look at it and tell you what you think. You, sh you should take a multivitamin. So that used to be that there. It's actually that the pendulum has swung a couple of times about whether or not a multivitamin is good for you. Um, there, a large study came out just this year called the Cosmos study. Cosmos or Cosmo study um, that showed that it was a meta-analysis with a lot of people. Um, and it showed that those who take a multivitamin um, they clearly have a little bit lower risk of dementia. And there's not a downside. I mean, if you take a standard multivitamin, there's not a downside to it, really. Um, so I, I now, because of this, I recently have been telling my patients to take a multivitamin. I don't think there's anything to lose, as long as it's not one that's got, you know, this for energy or for this or that or whatever. You know, just but a standard multivitamin um, is good for you. There are a couple, so because I get you know asked this a couple of uh, there are a couple that I'll tell you I do recommend vitamin D is one that I also recommend for every every should take vitamin D. Um, there. 
uh, D as in uh, delta. There's there are they, there are studies not only showing that people with a vitamin D deficiency have an increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, but now um, there, there's subsequent research that shows that people who take <laughs> take a screenshot of it. Now I can send you the slide too. Who said the patients who who uh, take a supplement it does reduce your risk. Um, I, Four thousand a day is a good round number that has that's very low risk. More than ten thousand a day for a long period of time will give you a kidney stone. That uh, um, so probably don't do that. But but uh, but that's sort of mega dosing. I do you know CoQ co ten hundred milligrams. Um, also very very safe. It's been studied uh, up to two thousand a day in the, in the heart literature, and that dose is safe. So hundred two hundred days fine. And that you you know. I, I say go ahead and take an omega three. It does not. Uh, it does not a supplement for to eating fish. But go ahead. Again, no downside to it. Do you guys hear Viagra prevents dementia? Excellent question. If you don't know, that's an excellent question. Um, the why we don't yet know. Uh, in, in 2020, right before the pandemic, actually, this like a small so, uh, a, a small study came out that showed that men took. It, actually, it was the way that they did the initial study is a way that a lot of medical research that, that some medical research survey data is taken, which is they, the researcher develops an AI program. They can go into a large database and do a z and ping a zillion different variables and say these pop out as statistically significant. It's, it's interesting that with, with the advent of AI and you know more sophisticated computer systems, it can now it can now do survey data. And so the the initial uh, research from this came from like a Medicare database review um, that a U.S. based uh, research group. Uh, did and they compare it to like ten other commonly prescribed drugs. Viagra raised up above them. It's a very it raises an interesting question. I've talked to my Emory colleagues about this a lot. Is it, um, it is there some intrinsic property of the drug that helps it dilate your veins to lesser extent your arteries? Um, you know, does that does it give confer that vascular impacts confer some kind of protection to your brain? Is it men who are healthy enough to have sex? Is it the sex itself? Um, that so it's you know it, again it's a, it, men who are prescribed Viagra and who are filling it regularly are the ones who got benefit. So um, so it's raised interesting questions. I'll tell you, it was the, so the initial study in 2020. It was debunked by a small study uh, a year or so later, and then just recently a a much larger. Um, uh, study a population study came and it actually showed that it rose above like 10 other control drugs that were used. And then there's people that there's a group that's looking at its effect on the brain cells themselves who, who believe that it's uh, it's going to make an impact. And so um, I can't tell you yet, I'm not necessarily giving, oh, I should have said this at first, I'm not giving any of you specific medical perspectives. <laughs> But uh, you know, it's it's. And I've gotten a lot of questions about it, and the answer is we don't know yet. But there appears to be something to it. Just basic advice. Basic good advice, and I'm almost done. I'm sorry. Uh oh. I think. Uh, I heard a study also like something that helps you, something exhilarating. So like skydiving, is an example. Something that's exhilarating. So therefore, does that also relate to Viagra that gets your blood flowing? Or exercise. Or I mean, there's something that would yeah. like, 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 Chris, what was the name of the actor, Chris Hemsworth, who came out and said that he had both of the ACO people. Oh, I didn't know that, okay. okay. So, so he went, I think, with a long time, so therefore, I put on the phone to somebody else. Something like that. I would believe, I'm, I'm not aware of, like, data or like a specific activity, but I would definitely believe it. Um, I definitely, I mean, and, and I guess just exercise, like, you know, like, yeah, you know, the blood flow you. Yeah, so, <laughs> so all of you should control your blood pressure, control your blood sugar, blood sugar, drink less alcohol. I hate to, you know, I, I, depression is like a bullet point on one slide. It deserves more of that topic in itself. Now, I'll tell you, there is, so, 
in, uh, in, at any stage of the game, controlling your blood pressure will lower your dementia risk dramatically. So you know, maintaining normal tension and normal blood uh, pressure is clearly a big Alzheimer risk factor. So do it. If, you, if you're diabetic, control your sugar. If you do, and you, and you maintain it at around the normal range, you know, you, the risk is directly related to glucose control. So if you control it, that's good. Um, coffee's good for you. Drink a cup or two. Or, or a pie. So I do. <laughs> coffee or tea. Coffee and tea both look good for you. Coffee looks better for you. Um, tea's got theophylline. It's a little it's a different ingredient. It's, it's, it's stimulant. It's got a lot of things in it. Both of them good. Um, but coffee or tea are good for you. Drink less alcohol. Any um, a glass of wine or coffee here and there is probably okay. Drinking a lot is probably not great. It, I would say probably it's not good for you. It will increase the dementia risk a little bit. Freedom <laughs> expression is interesting too because there is um, there there's evidence that actually SSRI, serotonin, you know, the drugs like Prozac and that category of drug. Um, actually appears to lower the risk of Alzheimer's disease a little, or of, of all cause dementia, a little bit. Um, now, uh, again, that's another, it comes from population data. So why is it? Because people are less depressed so that they're moving more, they're more active, they're socializing more. Um, I'll tell you, there are a couple of my colleagues at Emory that will that are more aggressive about like a low dose of either Prozac or Lexapro for patients with dementia as a just like what do you have to lose? I mean, frankly, I think you can put it in the water supply, but it's, you know, what do you have to lose? Um, I get a lot of questions about gummies. I have no idea. I don't know what's in them. Um, I, don't, you, I tell you, CBD people seem to sleep better. Um, there actually, there's, there, there's data that goes back 100 years. Right? There's data that's more than a century old on hemp seed oil and its medicinal benefit. And I'll tell you, it's safe. It's pure hemp seed oil, nothing else, no other junk in there. Um, then, then it's safe and probably does have some benefit to it. Um, I, the, the thing I hear most often from patients take CBD is they sleep better. Even if you take pain or headaches, stuff like that. It really does not seem to be as effective for those things, just from at, at my uh, experience. So I don't know that it comes up. Um, you should sauna. You should take a spritz if you can. A few times a week, a big Finnish study showed that people, again, population-based study, it was survey data, but, but people who reported that they sauna two or three times a week, it lowered their dementia risk, by like 50%, it was impressive. It, yeah, probably. I mean, that's gonna be my best uh, common sense answer. That's a common sense answer. Um, yes. Let me get to that. Is it okay that I'm going so far? As long as it's okay with everyone else. Is it okay with everyone else? All right, let me go back. All right. Slide a second. Let's We're also recording this, and we'll send it out. So, so, so sauna it does it, it clearly look beneficial. Obviously, after after period, healthy and staying there too long, I think they did. Um, uh, but uh, but uh, cryotherapy, I actually in preparation for this. Because I know it's popular now, especially among like you know, um, uh, in the, you know, the complimentary crowd and like weightlifters and stuff like that. They use these ice baths and cryotherapy. And I found a study that showed that it does. I mean, it was actually a random. It was a controlled trial. Some people ice bathed, some people ice bathed, some people didn't. Um, and it appeared to improve for cognitive performance in patients who already had an issue, patients with mild impairment. It looked like it improved their performance. I tell you, it, 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 what we know about um, like cold submersion therapy is it increases it acutely when you're in there, increases these things called cold shock proteins, and they're very, very good for you. 
take them out of that and give them to, to uh, neurons in a petri dish. It protects them, they, they maintain their stru ultra structure a little bit longer. Um, so these cold shock proteins are very good for you. Again, I mean, the advice I would give you, because I'm not a, uh, an exercise therapist, I'm not, I mean, I would just say talk to your doctor about what you're gonna do, if you do it. There's all kinds of uh, cryotherapy that you can do now. But the, I, I, I would, sh if you're gonna pick one, I'd take a schmitz. <laughs> What's that? That's probably okay too. I would say, I mean, well, the why is still a question. I mean, do you, you, you probably sweat out the junk. Um, and so, uh, there, there are such things as heat shock proteins too. They actually are related to cold shock proteins. Um, they're, and so, I, I, that, that's still up for debate, but, um, but uh, anyway, good question. Uh, could your medications cause dementia? So, you know, someone said, another question I get all the time, there are, um, there are studies that have shown links to medications and dementia. All of them are, it's studies, like I mentioned with Viagra, um, where there, there are, uh, where the researchers created a program that could go through databases. The first one that was done like that, actually, was in, and many of you probably heard this, it was, it was, it was in the UK where there's like a national health system. So they could, they've got this wide open database, millions of people, millions, millions of data points. Uh, and years, a few years ago, uh, researchers found that there, the patients who take proton pump inhibitors for gastric reflux have a higher incidence of dementia. Um, and so and they, you guys may have heard this, it was like a kind of big news when it came out. Um, you know, again, sort of the, the question, there's an association, but the why or the, the, the exact impact is still a, 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 a matter of question. What I tell patients, they're uh, the same type of study, same, uh, it, it was sluicing the database, it was a database association study, showed that anticholinergic drugs, um, Benadryl being like the, 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 the granddaddy of anticholinergics, do appear to increase dementia risk. Um, with Benadryl specifically, there's a, 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 uh, a clear direct relate, a dose relationship, so there's a clear relationship between how frequently and how much you take. I mean, have patients who take 25 milligrams of Benadryl every night for sleep, that's the active ingredient in everything that's got a PM on it, or a little moon on the, on the box, uh, z -quil, Tylenol, PM, um, you know, I, do, I would rather if you need something and take that than Ambien if you absolutely need something. I don't love Ambien. It, none of these is, is, is I'm going to make it clear, have been proven, but all of these have shown an association are probably not great. Um, you know, patients who need Ambien every night, I said, try to take something else if you can. Again, the associations, um, uh, it has not been proven. Um, uh, in patients who need benzodiazepines, high doses of benzodiazepines every day, um, and that's like the clonopin, Xanax, um, Valium, not great. Proton pump inhibitors, I just tell patients, can, if you can get off it, that's great. Some of these patients can't live without them. And I try not to, I don't want to, I don't want to put too much fear uh, there, but that is, um, but they, were, they, they, they were the original medication that rose out of these database association studies. Look, would, that be, would that be the same because trazodone is really good? Trazodone is probably okay. Trazodone, trazodone has an anticholinergic, a little bit of anticholinergic activity. For patients who need something every single night to sleep, they can if they don't. I mean, trazodone is the first one that I, I'll say, like, you tried that one. Um, it makes people foggy the next day. Some, they can't, it's got a long half life. It makes some people foggy the next day. Um, I don't, we got to wrap up. Okay, let me tell you. So, get good sleep. That's important. But can I do two more slides? So the or three. I'm gonna do three slides. Five minutes. <laughs> so, diagnostic testing for Alzheimer's has come a long way recently. You guys probably know this. There are amyloid PET scans, which are um, going to be covered soon, probably by inch. The CMS actually announced they were going to be covering them in January. They they. Haven't followed through with that fully yet, but it's, they're, they're probably going to be um, routinely done soon. 
They're about 90% sensitive and specific. They're, it depends largely on who's reading them, which is one of the issues. You have to have a, a usually an academic center is a good place to do that. Emory's where I send them the patient when they pay out of pocket. Spinal fluid biomarkers are the best right now. Um, the best biomarker testing for Alzheimer's disease. So you, this is a spinal tap where we check this amyloid, to, uh, a type of amyloid and a type of tau, a spore-linked tau. It's something called amyloid beta 42, and they, it's very, very sensitive and specific. So if you have cognitive symptoms and the spinal fluid is negative, it steers me away from Alzheimer's disease. It makes it it's strong evidence that that's not what's causing it. Soon there's going to be, and there actually is a blood test already called Facility AB. Um, we don't yet know how good it is, how, good, how well it compares to spinal fluid. The reps will tell you otherwise, but it's not something that I do as routinely. Soon it's probably going to be, it, yeah, it's probably going to be um, uh, ready for prime time in the next two years. Look, okay, I'll tell you two slides about the treatments, and I'm sorry if this is what everyone came for, but with the stuff that I talked to you about is more important, lifestyle prevention. The new treatment that a lot of people have heard about for Alzheimer's disease, uh, lecanemab, it's actually there's a category of these. There's edu uh, educanemab, lecanemab, and there's one that the FDA is debating whether or not to, improve, uh, to approve right now, uh, the third one. The lecanemab is the one that we use. Uh, it's, it's anti-amyloid, it's a monoclonal antibody, your diffusion it binds that amyloid and clears it out of your brain. Um, when it was in its, in its phase two trials, when they looked at amyloid scans, um, it was a grand slam. It, 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 it cleared almost all of the amyloid in almost everybody that took it on these amyloid studies. It made the cover of Science, the cover of Nature magazine. Um, it was very exciting. However, what that translated to afterwards um, in, in, in patients was not quite as impressive. It slows the progression by about 30%, 30, 30%, which is good. So when they studied patients who took the infusion, at each interval, they were a little less worse. And that after 18 months, that translated to 30%. Uh, they slowed the progression by 30%. Um, but there's a, there, there's a fairly significant risk of this thing called ARIA. Uh, which is an acronym that means amyloid-related imaging abnormalities. The brain can swell, it can ooze blood a little bit. So these drugs are okay, they are not great. For patients who are in the early stage of Alzheimer's disease, who don't have other significant medical issues, or who are not on a lot of drugs, it's pretty good, and I, I, I recommend uh, this for those patients. And finally, and I, I'm happy, I'll stay after the minute, so I'm sorry, I'm uh, Overstate my welcome. But you guys probably all saw this guy on 60 Minutes, Dr. Ali, Ali uh, Rizai, Rizai. So he's a neurosurgeon in West Virginia who is doing this thing called focused ultrasound therapy along with lecanemab, along with that infusion. Um, he actually, his research was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. He, what he has shown from these, uh, from his study, when he does, it, it's an ultrasound that he does on certain parts of the brain, it appears to improve the effectiveness of the lecanemab. So this plus the infusion uh, looks more effective than the infusion alone. Um, you know, they interviewed, they, they lost it and made it look great on 60 Minutes. I think it's more complicated than that. He is taking patients. He's the only one right now in the country that's doing it. But this is probably gonna be something that we see a lot more in the near future um, and uh, uh, with that, I will take a question. Let me see. Oh, no, here I have. So you can't, it's, it's a Yiddish proverb. I think I started with this last time, but I like this. It's a Yiddish proverb that you cannot outrun the moon um, uh, because we, of course, are on the lunar calendar. I think, you know, I, I, I I, I'm not sure what the second half that did, but you should uh, dance until sunrise. I, is that a good way to end? Yeah. Yeah. All right.
that the, the short answer that the chemotherapy does uh, often does have significant cognitive uh, side effects. Chemotherapy, especially more than immunotherapy. So chemotherapy patients who get sick, anything with anything that's platinum based, especially cisplatin. There's a few platinum, but end of the it's, it, those are neurotoxic, um, and so they definitely can impact cognitive function. Can, the, the, the diagnosis of cancer itself, I think I would tell you, it's more probably related to the cancer treatment than the cancer itself, but it obviously a lot of impact in cancer. Um, that's my answer to that. What is my professional, personal opinion of only um, re I, I e relying on the and other mini mental assessments uh, for the level of cognitive impairment. And, I mean, it's like everyone expects to draw a clock now. You know, it's almost a joke. We draw a clock, although it's a, it, it's a good screening test if somebody has already, is already moderately impaired, they're not going to be able to draw a clock. Um, the, the clock is not good. I'm, I actually think AI, I will mention AI again. AI it is very exciting because I think in the near future, it will be able to make cognitive assessments with, with a much higher sensitivity than even our best neurocognitive battery will now. I think it will be able to talk to you, scan your retina, which is another way. I, I think the AI Star Trek, it might be in the near future uh, for that. So, and I, and um, mark my words, like five years from now, I think that there, it, it, will, it will really revolutionize cognitive testing. Uh, cinema is above always taking medication earlier in an attempt to prevent dementia. And early intervention is key. Um, or this is so taking medicines early, of course. I, you know, the, the, the best and most important early in interventions that you can do are all lifestyle related. Um, like I said, like the first slide, Dr. the future, diet, exercise, socializing. Um, are the most important interventions for the pills that prevent dementia, for the pills that slow dementia, like uh, donepazil, mamanti, the old stuff besides lecanemab. I, I, the earlier you start them, the better they work. They have very modest benefit, but very little downside to them. So, I mean, I guess in that regard, like for patients we're going to take donepazil, which is Aricept. I, I, I started as soon as there's, it's clear that there's a problem, unless um, they, they're, they're, there's a, a drug that might interact with it. And the Menda, is that the same thing? The is the same thing. Are those kids beautiful? Oh. <laughs> 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 That's a bar mitzvah.